What up, HyperChange? We're here in San Francisco, about to take you on an exclusive tour of a startup called Magrathia, with the super ambitious goal of creating metals without mining. Structural metal is an industry that touches all of us in some way or form, but is extremely pollutive. But now, Magrathia is potentially poised to change all of that with their technology that turns seawater with renewable electricity into magnesium. Totally new way at an even potentially lower cost to leverage the renewable energy revolution to create metals here in America. We think this is a game-changing startup. We're investors at the ground floor, and today we're about to take you on an epic scene into the lab, interviewing the CEO. Let's roll. Okay, we're on the ground here in Oakland, Lab 42, Magrathia HQ. About to get a tour from Alex Grant himself. Ryan here, purified. They can turn that into magnesium. Hello. Hello, what's up, Alex? Hey, how are you, Dolly? Great. Come on in. Thank you. Oh, look, here's Jacob. Oh, wow. We are at Magrathia's headquarters in Oakland, California, and um, we're developing a new generation of technology for making magnesium metal from seawater and brines. This is where we uh, do the alchemy. There's lots of brine outside because I have a problem. <laughs> um, and we are also in the middle of building our pilot at the moment. So I used to work in Alcoa, took up a PhD, Cambridge University scholarship to do energy technologies. I learned electrochemistry, how electricity can be used to make chemicals of various kinds, and use that knowledge to kind of build out the battery supply chain in America over the last few years. So most recently working with Tesla, their pilot lines, and scaling up to hundreds of kilograms of uh, pilot scale ton quantities, basically. Yeah, we became really good friends like four years ago when he moved here to work for Tesla to, to, to to the Bay Area, and uh, I was also in the battery supply chain, so I was working in lithium, uh, consulting on resource projects all around the world, helping people figure out what types of process technologies to use for making lithium chemicals from all different types of natural resources. And it was Jacob that brought up magnesium, I mean. Magnesium was like this a little brother metal to aluminum that had so much more of the problem for magnesium was, was it's just energy. It's seawater and solar panels, and that's kind of it. This is a brick saw. We just bought it, but it's because we're cutting a lot of bricks. So uh, in here is our uh, brine pilot. We're taking all different types of uh, brine and salt resources from around the world, like we just saw, and cleaning them up a little bit. So there's a couple impurities in, in every resource that we don't like that uh, we know how to remove using relatively conventional hydrometallurgy. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already done it now multiple times on multiple brines. Um, so yeah, this is the first step in the process. And now I'm like having an aha moment of the dumbest thing ever, which is like the ocean is the biggest brine pool in the world. Right. So if you believe in a future of abundant renewable energy from wind and solar and geothermal or whatever else, then it's easy, much easier to believe in a future of magnesium metal that is price competitive with something like aluminum. So this is kind of a lame analogy of like the Tesla of mining, but just the way Tesla electrified a process that used a lot of fossil fuels and also did it at zero compromise in terms of performance. I feel like that's a super helpful way that I wrap my head around it. Cause it's like, you think about aluminum or steel making, it's like involves all this massive emissions, all this mining, all this smelting. And now it's like, we can literally use solar power to like electrify the whole process. So it's sort of like electrifying mining. Yeah, you electrify and you make a better process, better metal in the process. And to be clear, we've met most of the world's, or Western world's, I should say, uh, major automakers, and more than half of them have told us that, you know, in a world where they have access to low embodied carbon, uh, Western produced magnesium metal, they do definitely use a lot more of it. It's a wonderful material. Um, so we're solving exactly that problem. And this is a brine. Do you want to drink it? I will. Really? <laughs> if I won't die, I'm down. You might die. <laughs> We're here, we have an analytical lab, so we have a whole bunch of uh, instruments like auto titrators, TGA machine, um, science, various sciences to basically measure things that matter to us. This is our pilot lab. So here we're building a pilot that'll go a long way to proving out our technology uh, for making metal from these different resources. Um, and it'll be our headquarters for a while for things like analytical that we'll always need, you know, office space and things like that. So. I'm assembling a test cells to test different electrode materials. Nice. So we're funded by the Department of Energy to 
explore different materials for the anode specifically, right? Yep. Of the electrolysis cell. And Hannah is building this incredible little mini pile of electrolysis cell to test different materials to see how they behave. So this is a batch of salt that has been taken in as a raw brine. It's something that we've taken the water out to a sufficient extent. It's about 25% water, this one right now. So it's halfway through our process. Dry salt, that's what we do around here. Okay, so we got the salt. Okay. You turn the water into salt, what happens? Just come on in. This is the pilot room. So, and here's where we're building out the kind of core smelting part of our pilot. Inside this box is where we're going to actually split the magnesium salt to make metal. So the actual metal making will be right in here. Also worth mentioning, Magritte is only like a year and a half old as a company. So this is a super new pilot facility and they're just in the middle of like getting this all off the ground. So that's why a bunch of stuff's going on. Last but not least is the Magnesium Museum. Educating people on Magnesium Tunnel, showing them how incredible the material it is. So it's a third lighter than aluminum, four times lighter than steel, and uh, has been used in even large auto parts for decades. And it's not a story for the first time, right? I mean, Dow, when they began making this material back in the First World War, they had these demonstration units set up, particularly to show people just how different the weights were. Unfortunately, this is on the video, it's not going to be able to show it all of the viewers, but each one of these, identical volumes, but completely different in weight. Cross carbines, Corvette, LED, Jaguar, uh, that's the center console. That's like the middle of the car in, the, in between the seats. Um, we got engine blocks from BMW. Uh, the deck of that lawnmower is magnesium. This is a, uh, a Tesla screen and there's a magnesium die casting on the back. So like, you know, I can lift this with my feet. A uh, computer from the space program from the 90s, mostly magnesium. Magnesium snowshoes. So, what does Magrathia mean? Magrathia is uh, the planet that built the planet. We see our job as kind of rebuilding the planet after uh, kind of like the boomers destroyed it. Techno futurism propaganda littered throughout the office. It's like it's kind of the Herbert Dow Shrine, so we are. Uh, working on conducting the ghost of Herbert Dow into our lab. He was the first one to make magnesium metal electrolytically 100 years ago. Cumulatively, the majority of magnesium metal ever made was made with seawater electrolytically by Dow in Texas. I think we should have a power scheme on the table outside. This is a cool thing. So the original giga casting from a helicopter, commercial helicopter. It's gigantic. Wait, so is this made out of magnesium? It is made out of magnesium, yeah. Magnesium is used in so much, like every single car around us has a little bit of magnesium in it. But if Magrathia is successful, there's a potential where we can like make, instead of 1% of the alloy magnesium, 90% plus of the alloy magnesium. Because that's the really exciting, crazy vision of Magrathia is not just replacing the 5 billion of magnesium today, but replacing the 30 billion of aluminum, which is used to make cars. So, um, Lots to unpack there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, first thing first, Magrathia could build a really successful company with zero growth in the magnesium die casting market. There's already a really important and significant Western magnesium market that needs to be serviced. There's a very unique short-term opportunity to displace Chinese mag from that market because of sort of great power conflict and things like that. And give us the status quo. Like most magnesium is made in Russia and China and it's using what, like kind of run us down the problems with that. Almost almost all magnesium in the world today is made in China and Russia. Uh, the entire Western world, all of Europe and North America uh, has almost no magnesium production now. There was one producer that's kind of on their last legs. And, uh, so this is a production. national security concern? It's a major national security issue. Um, you know, if the CCP could just like flick their fingers and turn off the mag supply, it would completely shut down American and, and NATO kind of warfighting capabilities overnight. We would lose aluminum, we would lose titanium, we would lose even steel because it's used in desulfurization. So um, this is like a code red, like hair on fire 
supply chain you know issue um that is our focus right now that's going to be the market segment that that gets us to commercial scale and um and gets us you know generating earnings for example in in the long term um, we have this tremendous opportunity as you say to essentially displace aluminum and steel from anything that moves so from cars from helicopters uh, drones planes uh, magnesium has a big role to play because it's so light, and uh, and, that, and that was that was kind of always the case. But the problem the problem right now is that magnesium is so uh, so carbon intense to produce in China the way that they make it. It's basically a Rube Goldberg device of coal um, that automakers don't want to use it, principally because of the embodied CO two emissions and um, and because of the basically criticality. They don't want to have to rely on on, uh, on the Chinese government to uh, you know allow this place to flourish. Magrathia. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what you want to, but it seems like if what you're saying is true because of the cost of renewable energy going down, you can actually make it for, let's say, $2,000 a ton. So you could even undercut the Chinese prices or even match it and still make an incredible margin if what your technology works. And that's a game changer because all these automotive companies who've wanted to use magnesium for years can finally do it. And maybe you could explain why magnesium is better than aluminum. Like if I was an automaker and I could get my hands on magnesium for 5,000 a ton or 8,000 a ton made in the US from solar energy, why would that be better for my car? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's three things that, um, that people really like about mag, um, that it's lighter, of course. Um, that uh, it has very high energy absorption, so it's actually like kind of more crash worthy than aluminum. Um, and vibration damping is a big deal. Um, very easily die cast, kind of similar to aluminum. As you said, die casting kind of what was started as a magnesium technology, and giga casting only became possible with like new alloys for aluminum. Um, so you know that's a common theme in, in, in structural metals that alloy development unlocks new applications. So if you look back over decades in the history of, of magnesium literature, you'll see reference over and over and over again to the, the magnesium to aluminum price ratio. So these prices are never really discussed, you know, in a vacuum, one or the other. Uh, what matters is the ratio between them. From Jacob and I's perspective, we basically only see reasons why aluminum can get more expensive over time um, because of the cost of CO2 emissions and you know, various other things. Um, you know, resource depletion, et cetera. And there's, there's only really reasons why magnesium be can become cheaper if you have a good technology for, you know, essentially drying the salt. So, um, so we've, we've developed exactly that um, to own that cost structure that, that can deliver a low magnesium to aluminum price ratio. And that kind of, you know, opens the floodgates to, to magnesium die casting. Um, but the thing is these metals always go together too, right? Just to, just to know, right? Like almost all aluminum alloys have magnesium in them and almost all magnesium alloys have aluminum in them. So they're, they're, they're brother metals in a big way. So between magnesium and aluminum, there is a 30% weight loss. And that is huge for vehicles because the more weight you lose, the more weight you can lose. So the motor gets smaller, the battery pack gets smaller, everything about the vehicle gets more nimble and easier to turn, easier to accelerate, all of these different things. So yeah, if you replace a big part, like an aluminum gigacast, you're going to save an awfully large fraction of that weight of the vehicle. But if this works, like you're going to have these massive things near the ocean. Can you just like paint? Because that's what we thought was so cool. Like this whole story. And then we saw the image of like this massive foundry next to the ocean with turning sunlight and salt into, into that metal. So can you like paint this picture of what it looks like if Magrathia has a mega commercial plant? Yeah, I mean, we'll build uh, we'll build smelters that will kind of look like aluminum smelters a little bit. They'll be big, long buildings uh, with um, with a, with a kind of a brine plant up front uh, with ponds where we'll store and process brine and, and seawater. And uh, um, you know, there'll be little parts of it that kind of look like Dow's old plant. There'll be parts of it that yeah look like an aluminum plant. There'll be it'll be kind of a hodgepodge. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll make sure to invest in, you know, uh, lots of arts to make sure they're, they're, of course, very pretty smelters, which is important. <laughs> the, the, the end effect is we, you know, decarbonize light metal. We've eliminated the embodied CO2 emissions of making aluminum. Um, we eliminate mining from the supply chain of light metal, which is, um, which is you know, kind of crazy if you think about it, right? Like, uh, we mine uh, primary Amazon rainforest in, in, in Brazil to, to extract bauxite to make aluminum today. It's catastrophic. It's really bad, actually. So, um, so we can help kind of mitigate the need for that. And as you said, you know, we imbue all these kind of like physics benefits to uh, to vehicles of all of all kinds.